And then I was like, I just looked down, saw the blood. I, I couldn't breathe. And I was like, oh, I'm about to die. And uh, so I walked down the street, pretty much accepted that I was going to die, laid down on the ground. My friends came over me. It's kind of just like a movie scene. And they were like, you know, like, oh, you good? You good? And I'm like, no, I'm like, not good, obviously. You know, just, and I told them, I was like, hey, just tell my mom, my brother, and my sister I love them and it's going to be okay. And I just closed my eyes, passed out, thought I died. And then uh, I ended up waking up to the paramedic uh, a few minutes later, uh, giving me a sternum rub. And I remember the whole ride to the hospital, you know, I mean, blacked out here and there, but I remember mostly all of it. And they declared me a homicide before I even got to the hospital. Uh, and I ended Were up you dead? A, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, I didn't have any, like, bright light type, you know, yeah. situation. I just passed out and then I woke up. Yeah, so I think I just went unconscious. But uh, from losing blood, from losing blood, yeah. Um, Did you guys? You say you got stabbed in the lung? I no. collapsed my lung. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, nicked the outer sac of my heart, and then uh, nicked my liver, and then uh, the one in my back luckily missed all my nerves, and so. I'm Spencer Stone, and you're watching me on Living Large. Yeah. My guy. <laughs> Welcome into the podcast, episode 25 of Living Large. If you guys are listening on a podcast app, don't forget to rate us five stars. And on YouTube, smash the like button. Always leave a comment. It helps me out, guys. Today's podcast is probably going to be the, one of the most intense stories that I think I've ever shared. And whew, I don't know if you're ready for this. Buckle your seatbelts. Buckle the fuck up, because my man on the podcast today has not only survived... Uh, a terrorist attack on his way to Paris, but he also survived a getting jumped and stabbed several times just six weeks after that attack. Welcome on to the show, Spencer Stone. Thanks for having me, man. You have one of the most insane stories and lucky stories I think I've ever yes. heard in my life. We spoke uh, over lunch a few, no, a month ago. About a month ago. Met yeah. for the first time, and I was like, dude, gotta have you on the podcast. Uh, before we get into everything that did go down, Talk about why you were over in Europe. So I was in Europe at the time because uh, well, I was stationed on a small island outside of Portugal. You like, were in the... I was in the Air Force. The Air Force, I, okay. I was a medic in the Air Force and... Uh, could you fly planes? I could not. My vision's not good <laughs> enough. That is a common misconception. Yeah, Everyone's okay. like, oh, you fly, bro? I'm like, nah, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> smart enough and I don't have good eyes. So, uh, But I was stationed at, on a small island like 700 miles off the coast of Portugal. So like okay. literally in the middle of in the ocean. You speak Spanish? No, no, okay. no. But uh, I tried. I mean, I tried to learn Portuguese and Spanish, similar, but it just sounds like they're yelling at each other all the time. So I right, gave up. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, so I'm over there, pretty much working on an ambulance, uh, doing my thing. But it's kind of like a small, chill island, and uh, I had a bunch of vacation saved up, and so I hit up my two basically childhood friends. One of my buddies, Alec, who I had lived next door to since I was about like five years old. You grew uh, up in Santa, Sacramento. I, yeah. yeah, I grew up in Sacramento, uh, born and raised there. And uh, now, was your friend in the army as well, or the Air Force? Sorry. He was. He was in the army. Yeah. Okay, so it. I was in the Air Force. My buddy Alec was in the army. He was an uh, infantryman. And uh, since you were in the in medical stuff in the Air Force, did you have to go to medical school, or how's that work? You yeah, you get sent to medical training. So I got like my EMT like nursing skills because like basically I was a medical technician. Uh, so they can basically put you anywhere. You can be working in an ER, ICU. I mean, I got, you know, like my dream in the military, like I wanted to be like the most badass person ever. I wanted to yeah. be like pararescue, doing like the insane shit. Just like propelling out of helicopters. Yeah, exactly. Like real life Rambo stuff, yeah. you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but the, 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 the vision disqualified me. So uh, I ended up going to the medical field and then I got put into pediatrics. So it's like, Oh wow. The, like the chillest, you know, like, yeah, dealing you know, with kids. Handing out, yeah, <laughs> dealing with kids. It, but it ended up being awesome. And this I was right after it. college. This was, yeah, I got I me. Mean, it's kind of screwed around after high school. I, I didn't go to college. I mean, I, I went, took a couple classes. I didn't take it seriously though. And I was just, I knew the school wasn't my thing at the time. And so I Joining the military is something I always saw myself doing, and so I just did it. Can I ask something? Yeah, go Why ahead. does one join the military? I think there's many different reasons. Personally, I joined the military because I felt like I hadn't really done anything with my life. And, uh, you know, I feel like my mom really sacrificed a lot, put up with a lot, raised me, my brother, and my sister by herself. And, you know, 
like I said, she, she gave up a lot of uh, personal things in her own life uh, to give me the life I had. And I feel like I wasn't doing it justice if I didn't really go like make something of myself. So I was like, all right, I haven't done shit with the first 18, 19 years of my life. Mm -hmm. I need to go do something. And to me, doing something was the most like extreme thing in the military, which is being a pararescue man, which mm -hmm. is like the Navy SEALs of the Air Force. Okay. And uh, so I joined for that. But then, I mean, to be real, I joined for college money. Okay. Uh, you know, yeah. I joined to travel. Those, I had yeah, never a lot left of people California. joined for the benefits, right? Yeah, tons okay. of benefits in the military. You know, I had never left the state of California until I was 20. So, okay. until I joined the Air Force. Okay. So, leaving for the military was a huge change for me and, you know, for many different reasons. But, yeah, so... Does the Air Force, because you always see these movies and like the cliche, like army, military, discipline, does the Air Force discipline as hard as like the army? There's definitely discipline in the Air Force, but... Is it like you have to wake up, I wouldn't tuck say, your bed in, like load your shotgun, like all that yeah. kind of stuff? <laughs> Minus the shotgun. Okay. You know, like a lot of folding clothes in basic training, believe okay. it or not. So it's like, you know, you get up super early, you know, you're going to PT, you you know, come back and you know, they have you do a bunch of stuff. But I would say it's among the easier basic trainings uh, out of all the different branches, for sure. The uh, Air Force. The Air Force, I would but say. I, I mean, but they, it's still not easy. The flying you know? part is pretty intense. Yeah. Like uh, pilots, they especially when they go over like during the Star Spangled Banner during games, they're like oh, yeah. this close. Well, that's the dream job you yeah. know, for everybody in the Air Force. Like everyone would love to do that, but it's extremely difficult because a lot of people... They wouldn't even know that they're disqualified from doing that job unless you go take those medical tests. You know, you're like usually what gets people kind of like what got me is their eyes. Uh, really? Yeah. So not only do you have to be super smart, uh, generally, I mean, people just don't pass the medical exams. So the military, like say, say you want to join, uh -huh. you, you can't just join and be in. You still have to be like qualified, no. right? You know, believe it or not, man, a lot of people can't even get into the Air Force. It, wow. it's it's one of the harder branches to get into especially when we're not at like currently at a full-fledged war you know mm -hmm. uh so most people i would say over i guess i don't want to give a percentage because it, it's probably a bullshit number <laughs> but you know it seems like 50 percent of the general population right. are not even capable of like going in that's insane yeah well congratulations on getting in Thanks, and i could man. tell you it was a shock <laughs> you're the first person on my podcast to wear a suit and tie yeah is you that know, some military I, doings I figured it, no no i usually <laughs> do not wear a suit it's like only because i'm working on this project right now okay uh called unsung heroes okay we'll get into that in a we'll little get bit into that. yeah so i had to come with the intensity today you know for the serious looking story. like a, a you know stud Thanks, right bro. now i gotta I say you, bro. all right so you're over in europe you're doing your military thing and you have a vacation so you hit up your two boys mm -hmm. and you're like Hey, come out here? Pretty much, you know. Uh, Let's get into the story. So, you know, I'm stationed in Portugal at the time, and I got a bunch of vacations saved up. I, like I said, hadn't been able to travel much throughout my life, so I'm just like, screw it. I'm this close to How Europe. Old are you? Uh, at this time, I'm 23, just okay. turning 23. Got it. I actually turned 23 in Rome. And okay. then, uh, so, you know, I hit my buddy up, uh, my, my friend Anthony, who uh, is from Sacramento as well. And uh, he's a senior at Sacramento State at the time, and but he's like a little bit strapped for cash, and he's like, I don't know, man, I don't know if I can afford that. And I'm like, bitch, just take out a credit card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll pay that shit you'll back. Figure it out. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. So like he he did, and then uh, so he ended up coming with, and then Alec, me and Anthony started in uh, in Rome, and then went up to Venice, Munich, Berlin. Then we all three met in Amsterdam, and then great place, great place. Yeah. We had a great time, <laughs> uh, and then we're headed to Paris. So we so get Amsterdam to Paris, Amsterdam to Paris. Okay. Um, and, uh, we get to the train station and we actually didn't, we almost ended up not even going to Paris that day. Like we were going to stay a couple extra days cause we're having such a good time there. And, uh, but we decided, you know, just to go anyway. And we show up to the train station and we bought first class tickets because uh, we're ballers like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, Even though your boy was struggling to get out there you in the know, first place. I was like, now you got to live, baby. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so we basically helped this elderly couple uh, get into, you know, they ask us to help with their luggage and, and, and all that stuff. So we're like, all right, cool, whatever. You know, we, we go into the basically the middle of the train. We see this area and we're like, ah, oh, this seems cool. Cause like, depending on which train you're on, whether you have first class tickets or not, there's really not that much of a difference. Right. Sometimes yeah. it's nice. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not. So we were like, ah, oh, this was good enough, whatever. And, uh, we sit down there and the Wi-Fi like, wasn't that good. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go check the first class, see if it's any better, uh, all the way at the end of the, at the end of the train. So I go over, it's like a real first class, 
better Wi Fi. Mm-hmm. They're like just getting ready to like serve food and drinks. So I'm like, oh hell yeah! So like yeah. I come back and I, and I get Anthony and Alec, and I'm like, oh, let's come on, let's go to our seats, and we say goodbye to the elderly couple. We go up there, we settle in, <clears throat> uh, you know, we drink a little French wine, eating sandwiches, just relaxing. Uh, some baguettes. You know, yeah, some getting into our French shit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh, so basically we we pass through uh, Brussels, and that's when the terrorist gets on board, and his name is Ayub El Kazani. He was uh, a part of ISIS, and okay. uh, he was actually also connected to the Bataclan theater attack where they killed over 100 people at that rock concert. Uh, he was connected to the Belgium uh, airport bombing. Uh, and so, you know, just Terrible a real bad person. guy. Yeah, real bad guy. Uh, he comes on the train. Uh, he's got an AK-47, 300 rounds of ammunition, a 9 mil pistol, a box cutter, hammer, and lighter fluid. How did he bring an AK-47 onto a, at a train? The t- at the time, there was no metal detectors or nothing. You get on that train with whatever you mm-hmm. have in your bag. No one's checking Oh, anything. so it was in like a duffel bag? It was, yeah, it was in a roller roller bag and a backpack. Okay. So he goes into the bathroom and right outside our train car. And, so, you know, each train car is connected by a corridor with like luggage and, you know, a bathroom. Now, is there cameras on the train or do you memorize Not that? Like, I know is this of. your memory? This is all of my memory. Okay. And if they have cameras, they never released it to us. Cause, wow. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you why that's, that's probably for the reason for that. Uh, but. So he's, you know, in that area, which is closed off to the general public, right? It's, it's more of a confined space. Uh, and he's in the bathroom getting pumped up. He's watching, like, extremist videos on his cell phone. And uh, he, and there's two guys outside the bathroom waiting to go, one by the name of Mark McGallion, who ended up pretty much saving my life. I consider my, him my hero. And then another French banker, uh, we call him Damien. It's his alias. He doesn't want to be having his name out there because he lives in Paris. Mm-hmm. Uh and uh, so Ayub comes out of the bathroom, shirtless, backpack strapped to the front of him, holding the AK, like ready to rock. And uh, Damien basically lunges at him, grabs him by his throat. Mark ripped the AK-47 out of his hands. And then uh, Mark is a you know American born. He was born in uh, Virginia, and then but moved to Paris when he was like 18, with like 400 bucks in his pocket. And uh, he gets the gun. He's like, you know, he hasn't really held an assault rifle before. Mm-hmm. He's like, let me just get it away from him, which was smart. And uh, he runs into our train car with it. And uh, the, you know, he, the terrorist pulled out the nine mil. Uh, and what I believe happened, he dropped the magazine out of the pistol. So then he only had one round left in the chamber. Uh, but I don't think he knew that. And he goes, shoots Mark. Uh, the bullet, you know, goes in his upper back, upper left shoulder. Bounces around his rib cage, broke two ribs, uh, collapsed his left lung, and then came out of his neck and sever- severed his carotid artery. So he's like gushing, gushing blood, you know. And uh, I was asleep. You know, I had like Bose yeah. noise canceling headphones on. I'm listening to a little Anthony Hamilton, you know what I'm saying? Jeez. Like drinking my wine. And uh, so you didn't I, even hear it. I didn't hear it. I didn't even know what was going on. Uh, I, but what woke me up was a train employee that saw what was happening and he ran in the other direction and so he goes by i'm sitting like this and my friend alec is sitting to the left of me and then the aisle is to my right and then across the aisle is a single seat with my friend anthony sitting and so he runs by and, I, and it's like shoo, that he kind of bumps my shoulder and i'm like I'm like i look at him like why is he running like that and then i i take my headphones off and the first thing i hear is glass breaking people screaming i turn around and I see Ayub, the terrorist, uh, coming in and then picking up the AK-47 where Mark dropped it. And I just see, just loads around into the chamber. And I'm just like, holy shit. Like, it was just clear as day. How this far is a away terrorist. He? This, he's like 30 feet uh, from far. me. So I have some distance to cover. Far but close, yeah. Far but close, exactly. Uh, and so pretty much I'm like looking down the aisle. And I'm like kind of, you know, I, I thought maybe he jammed it or something like that. He just hadn't started shooting yet. And uh, my buddy Alec kind of hits me on the shoulder and he's like, go Spencer. And I'm like, the fuck? Like me? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh hell? shit, I gotta go. But I'm like, oh, you're in the action Why'd he tell you to go? Why didn't he go? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm in the, I'm next to the aisle. Oh, you gotta get God. up first, man. But it was good. Cause you I, had, like, I was kind of going a split anyway. A, split second to react. Like, split second decision. Am I going to sit and hide behind my chair? Or am I going to go try to do something? Exactly. And you know what? It's what made you, you go? Your, just that I had no other option. Uh, and, I felt like there was this force that just like catapulted me out of my seat, which I believe is God. Uh, and 
you know, so I, you, but you put yourself in that situation, you're going 200 miles, 200 miles an hour, roughly on this train in the middle of the countryside. There's nowhere to go. He's got an automatic KK. Mm-hmm. You're either going to sit there and wait to get shot, executed, or you're going to do something. And to me, in my opinion, I'm like, well, I'm gonna at least go out in a blaze of glory. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, hopefully my family knows I went out fighting. Right. And, uh, so I, I get up and I'm running at him. Uh, he raises the rifle at me. Uh, it turns out nothing was wrong with it. No malfunction, nothing. Uh, and, but then he pulls the trigger and it was a bad primer. Uh, and if anyone listening to the podcast doesn't know what a primer is, it's what basically ignites the gunpowder in the casing of the bullet and propels the bullet out you and shoots you. So that was a dud click. Doesn't go off. Does the bullet not just jams? It's just a like he pulls the trigger and just nothing happens. Okay. Uh, but the bullet's still there. So in order for him to get the gun working, the bullet's still in the chamber, he would have to cock it back again okay. and then load a new round into it. Okay. So... Click. It doesn't go off. And, and he's shoot. Is he pointed at you? I'm the only person standing up, and he points directly at me. So and it doesn't. Fire. I would have been the first one. Yeah, to get shot. Uh, besides Mark. And uh, but it doesn't go off. Thank God. Uh, and I run down the aisle, and you know, I pretty much like close my eyes or I blacked out, and because I'm just like still expecting to get lit up at this right. point. And uh, I make it to him. I'm like, oh shit, I made it to him. And then, but then he smacks me in the face with the gun, basically like just bitch slaps me mm-hmm. with the with the AK. Yeah. And uh, so I can't see anything out of the, my left side of my face, my blind on my left eye, and uh, bleeding everywhere already. And you know, luckily I've been training jujitsu for like the past year at that point uh, in Portugal, and a little bit before that too. I always dabbled in it throughout my whole life. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm on the ground with him. And I'm just like, you know, because that was another. Th- piece of confidence that told me inside that if I could make it to him, I know I could do something. Like mm-hmm. if I could just get it right, in this right. guy's face where You're I could training. postpone him, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's one thing to tackle someone, but all right, you tackle him and you're face to face with him. What are you going to do next? Yeah. You got to beat you him know? up. So I, it's like, yeah, I, like, I had jujitsu to rely on, yeah. you know? And, uh, so I'm basically trying to reach for the AK. I feel him, you know, ripping it away from me. We both stand up. He drops it. I take his back, I put him in a rear naked choke, uh, and then pretty much slam myself and him against the side of the train. Uh, and now we're stuck in between these this table and these uh, two chairs. Where's everyone else during this? Watching? Everyone else is watching. Yeah, I mean, frozen. You frozen. Know, in fear. And, and you know what, at that point, there wasn't enough room for really much of anyone else to get involved. Uh, and, and when you took off, where's your boy? They're behind me. They're coming. Oh, come. uh, okay, yeah, they're coming. Yeah, I mean... Okay. Alec told me to go, but then he honestly, he, he took a minute to get down. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would but, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, he still came up though. Uh, and, um, you know, but I'm holding the terrorist, pr- trying to choke him out, but I don't have the choke all the way in. You know, it's just Is he fighting crazy, you back? panicky. He's fighting me back, but he, he pulls out the pistol that he just shot Mark with and he reaches back like this because I'm on his back. You right, know? right. So he has to reach back and he pu- I feel the muzzle of the, the pistol go against my head. And I'm just like, oh shit! Like I'm just getting my blade, my brain's blown out right now. It's over, and click doesn't go off because he had dropped the magazine and there was nothing left in it. So uh, this guy shot two shots at you. Two shots at me, and both of them didn't have. Like, one was a dud. One was a dud, and that one, one was empty. But he thought it was loaded. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, and so my buddy, pretty much right as that happens, my friend Alec runs up, rips the pistol out of his hands, and then starts to hit him in the face with the pistol. And then I'm thinking like, you know, that's all the weapons he's got. Mm -hmm. And then I feel this like burn on the back of my neck and and I look over and my thumb is like hanging like halfway off and uh, I can see my bone and everything. And I'm like, I'm like, what the hell? I was like, I just looked at my thumb. I was like, how the fuck did that happen? You didn't feel it? Didn't feel it. Just the adrenaline and everything. And, uh. I look over his shoulder because uh, right I'm on his back and, and I see him holding like a six inch box cutter blade and him just like swinging it around. He's like started cutting up my arm to like to get me to let go of him. And turns out he was reaching back like this as well and uh, basically trying to slit my throat. And so I basically I had two like long slashes on the back of my neck. What? And uh, so I, as soon as I see the knife, though, I'll, I scream like, hey, he's got a knife. Get him off me. Uh, I say that a couple of times and then I kicked him off me and then we're pretty much surrounding him at this point and he had dropped the knife and it was like the first time that nobody had a weapon in their hands. Mm-hmm. And so like, we kind of like looked at each other and we're like, 
just beat shit. the fuck yeah, out of them. Yeah, yeah, just beat the fuck out of them. Yeah. Do whatever you can. So I just started swinging, 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 you know. And then uh, we're all, I mean, we're all beating on him. And then he's either pushed or shoved into me. I pretty much use his momentum to throw him over his table. And uh, then now me, Alec, and Anthony are all putting our weight on his back, but he's still struggling. You know, like mm-hmm. this guy's like, he's not stopping. Yeah, he's so, not giving up. Yeah, so my friend Alec takes the pistol, tells him, hey, stop resisting, stop resisting. My He was an infantryman in the Army, so he had just actually gotten off a nine-month deployment in Afghanistan. Nothing happened, and wow. then we go on vacation, That's and this insane. happens. Yeah, and so he puts it to his head, cocks it back. Was it like, loaded? We thought it was loaded, so okay. like we were like, oh, we're about to you know, yeah, like, yeah. shoot this guy. And uh, we're like, hey, stop moving, stop moving, stop moving. My buddy clicked. Was it a lot more off. intense than that? It was a lot. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you want me to scream, <laughs> yeah, here, yeah. you know. But um, you know, we're just, I'm like, hey, stop, mother, you know, yeah, stop, yeah. motherfucker, stop yeah. moving, you know, like uh, was we're, he re- saying we're anything? ready to kill him. Uh, no, at this point, you know, he's not saying anything. And uh, he just was by himself. By himself, lone, lone attack. Uh, and thank God. And so uh, you, you, your friend, actually fired the gun. He put, he put it to his head. And then we said, stop moving, stop moving, stop resisting. Uh, and then we, you know, gave him a second or two and then click, didn't go off. Then we were like, oh shit, like it's just not loaded, cock it back. And then he cocked it back again, same thing. He's like, stop, stop, stop. And then click, didn't go off. Uh, so there's just no and then, So that's when he looked and he's like, oh, it's, it's empty. And mm-hmm. then so he just threw it. And that's when I just said, fuck it. And I threw him in another rear naked choke. It did basically did the same thing, slammed myself against the other side of the train and then got the choke in and choked him unconscious. And, uh, I was, I mean, I'm telling you, man, I was, I was seeing red. Mm -hmm. I was hands down, had no problem. I wanted to kill him. Like Mm -hmm. I was so ready. Like I wouldn't even recognize myself in that moment though. Right. Right. Because a killer be killed. And I'm like, you like, you just sliced my thumb off. You, you, you just, I don't know what you just did to my neck. I'm just like, I'm going to kill you motherfucker. You know, I'm I'm pissed off. I'm just totally seeing red. And you just, yeah, tried to kill everyone here. And, uh, so I, I'm pretty much choking him and he'd gone limp uh for about a minute so unconscious he was unconscious yeah for about a minute after and i held the choke so i was just gonna choke him until he was brain dead and uh what stopped were you thinking this at the time or were you just like i this is i'm not stopping at anything uh i was thinking at this time like i'm gonna kill him okay uh and i all of a sudden my my friends scream out like hey this guy's been hit and i look over the seats and I see Mark stand up uh, from underneath the seat because he had kind of like crawled underneath and played dead essentially. Mm-hmm. And uh, he gets up and I just see the blood gushing out of his neck. So he he got his main artery in his neck. Mm-hmm. So he's been lost bleeding out this blood. entire time. Yeah. Already lost a lot of blood. How long did this whole process take? The whole fight in re, in in real time was probably max two minutes. And what did it feel like? Fifteen minutes. Oh, it felt longer. It okay. felt way longer. Yeah. Uh, but I, I see him and I'm like, okay, like today's your lucky day, dude. Like I'm like, I'm a medic. Yeah. Like I like hold this guy down. Like I'm going to go over here. So I go over there and I take my shirt off and I was, cause I was used that as like a bandage, mm-hmm. uh, to put against his neck and hold pressure with, but I was like, oh shit, it's his artery, you know? And like I said, I'd been working at a pediatric clinic. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like I had never seen anything like this, mm-hmm. like this type of trauma, and I'm like a train for it, but I've never yeah, seen it. Right. And it's true. And you just almost got killed by a terrorist and you have no thumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, basically. And, uh, <laughs> you know, just casual day, bro. Yeah, it's a lot, a, light, of, a lot of things going day. on. <laughs> You're like, when's this going to end? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, uh, I, you know, I see that like his neck is like pumping blood. So I'm like, oh, that's his artery. Like this is going to do nothing but like basically be a sponge. Yeah. And so I stuck my fingers with the hand. I, like your ha- blood thumb yeah. is halfway off, uh, into the, he had a hole in his neck. And so I stuck my fingers in the hole. Then I could feel the artery kind of like pulsating around in there. And then I just found it, clamped it and the blood flow just completely stopped. And then we held that position for like 30 minutes until we got to the next train station. Yeah. And he survived. And he survived. He's alive. We're like best friends. We, we travel together, uh, going trips and what? things like that. We've been back to Amsterdam. He's super chill. He's like like a, like a very hippie guy, uh, but I love him to death. That is We're forever bonded. You this know? is yeah. This is the most insane story, and I have so many other questions that I want. My, my guy I can answer. stay as long as you want. Yeah. You know? So you you pinch his artery. Mm-hmm. Terrorist is passed out. Is anybody attending to him? Uh, like so in case yeah, he when, wakes up. When I threw him down, uh, they 
uh, there's a British man and then my friends who took like the train conductor's ties and like hog tied him. Okay. And so he, like you said, was he saying anything? He started to say something after he woke up, but he was unconscious for like a good 15 minutes. Like I thought I did kill him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he started to scream, give me my, give me my gun back. And I was like, in and I was like still pissed off. In yeah. English in or? English, okay. which is, I was, which just kind of surprised me. And, uh, I was like looking back and I was like, dude, you're lucky I can't get up right now because if I could, nothing would stop me from putting a bullet in your head. Yeah. Like, I don't give a fuck, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, you said that to him? I, I said a lot worse, yeah. but I won't <laughs> repeat it on here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so what's, what's crazy is that the train employees that ran away, they he, he took him and a couple of other employees and they locked themselves in this like panic room the type employees thing. did the employees like locked us off and like left us in there and That's there was up. actually like a famous french actor on the train who was like banging on the door for them to open it with his wife and two small small kids there and uh when the train stopped because the actor uh hit the emergency alarm for the train and stopped the train and uh they jumped off the train ran across a field hopped a fence and caught a cab in the left stop no yeah i'm not playing did they even call the cops uh i think the alarm did that for us okay so it, it did some help but then we had to get the train going again but mark's bleeding out you know so it just like caused problems but you know uh so this guy's sitting tied up for 30 <coughs> minutes talking crap i'm talking shit well i'm with mark you know just focus on him still holding his artery still holding his artery for this entire 30 minute thing with your thumb off Mm -hmm. yeah and the adrenaline started to wear off like halfway through right so i started to feel what was the response by everybody else on the train um it was everyone was just in such shock like did people uh, stay on this car or they dip some people dip some people stayed uh there was one girl uh in particular i remember like looking up uh, cause I just pretty much put my head down the entire time and I look up and I remember her just being in a fetal position and just like staring at me and Mark on the ground. And I just like looked at her and I just put my head down. But that's like, I don't know why specifically I always remember her mm-hmm. and like her face. Uh, so this is clearly the worst case scenario to happen in life. Like, yeah, very traumatic experience. Is this something that haunts you? Or caused any like PTSD, if you will, mm-hmm. or no. mental trauma. I used to say that no, but I think as time goes on, I recognize that I do. Like I'm definitely different, right? You know, uh, than what I used to be. Uh, but I what wouldn't you, say it's a huge problem in my life. You what know makes what I'm it easier for you than most people? I feel like to be able to talk about this so freely and like I think strictly because nobody died. Okay. And we didn't kill the terrorists, which in the moment I wanted to kill them. Why? Why? But I'm why glad is it better? Didn't. Why? Because, in my opinion, that would have been the easy way out okay. for him. Uh, now and, he has to and now he has to suffer and pay for what he's done and what he was going to do and what he's done in the past. And uh, he could have done even more after. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, and you know what? We don't need that on our conscience. I don't need to kill someone. So, why Can should I, I ask have you a question? that on me? Yeah, go ahead. If you would have killed him. Would you be at risk to go to jail? Actually, uh, there was uh, an employee or so, or somebody on the train that tried to stop me from choking him because I guess he was like basically trying to prevent that from happening because uh-huh. I guess the laws in France are, you know, like their self-defense laws are, are pretty weird. Okay. Uh, but, you know, like we were like getting calls from multiple presidents at the time. Right, right. I'm like, if I would have killed him, yeah, would have been yeah. no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, of course. he's I an mean, ISIS terrorist. Right. You know, it, I think I would have got a pass. Was he wanted? Uh, he was on the FBI watch list. Uh, just on the watch list? He was just on the watch list, yeah. yeah but as far as I'm concerned, no no wanted stuff. I don't, I don't know. You know. That's They keep, keep you in the dark on that stuff. You know, they don't tell us a lot. Right. That's so crazy. Such an amazing story. And the reason, guys, that... I'm having him on the podcast and you know, this podcast entertains or, yeah, I'm sorry to make it such a serious, no, serious no, mood it's, in it's here, really guys. good because it just shows us, you know, like how appreciative we are, you know, like, and you being like, I you always think if stuff like that happens, for example, like nine 11 being on the plane when it was hijacked, mm-hmm. what do you do in that situation? And it's like, you either fight or flight. And in your case you fought and you were able to save hundreds of people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
but the reason that this pertains to like live in large and so you guys, once all this goes down, you write a book, right? Yeah. Well, our life completely changed. Completely changed. Completely changed. Uh, we became international heroes overnight, right. you know? What was that like? Insane. I did didn't you, even fully realize. Did you have a feeling of like, I'm the shit? Or were you like still f- I fucked was up? Definitely not a feeling like I, I'm the shit because I, I don't like to be that way. Yeah. You know? Uh, but how did. But there's like, definitely. It's like a feeling of like, man, I really proved something to myself. Like, validated things I said I feel like I'd always do and I lived up to it. You know? Right. Going back to like when you were 18, you said you hadn't done shit. Yeah. That like, and like, you know, just knowing that. If something happens like that, I guess I can handle myself or I have the strength to stand up against it, you know, uh, but what does a hero feel like? Like, well, I mean, I don't feel like a hero. You don't That's feel like a thing. hero. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Because in reality, I mean, the honest truth is I didn't get up with the intention to save everybody. Mm-hmm. I got up with the intention to save myself. So okay. when I looked down the aisle and I saw everyone just looking at him like this, you know, I was just like, well, I'm not going to die. Right. You know, so I'm going to do something. And that's how I ended up being. So I can't say I was like getting up to be like, I'm going to save the day, you know, like, so I don't consider myself a hero, but I, uh, am very appreciative, uh, that people consider me one. So that's really awesome. I mean, you're a hero to me. You're my hero. Thanks, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, so afterwards you, you write a book and then you reach out to Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, uh, we didn't really reach out to him. We got an award uh, on the Spike TV Guys Choice Awards, like the Hero Award, and he, Clint Eastwood presented it to us, and we were getting ready to publish our book at the time, and, you know, it's like we knew Clint, this is what Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood does, yeah. you know. Legend. Yeah, and uh, so we're like, hey, guys, like we have to say something to him, you know. So we, we knew we were going to go back in the green room and chat with him a little bit, and we just, like, put it out there as a joke. We are like, hey, Clint, man, you, we're writing a book right now. You should turn it into a movie. And he's just like, yeah, send me the book. And we were like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, yeah. that worked? You yeah. know? And then uh, it just pretty much went from there. The craziest thing, because when I saw the trailer for this movie, you guys are in the movie. Yeah. Like, he used the people from the actual scenario, you three, and had you as the main characters in the movie. Which was, is not a, doesn't happen often. Doesn't happen. Yeah. So basically, overnight, well, not overnight, but over time, this tragic event turns your career into a way different direction. Yeah. Now you're an author. Now you're an actor. You know, now you're working on some other things that we'll get into. Mm-hmm. I also go or like around the country and I and I give speeches, like motivational life story, you know, right. things like that. What was it like acting in a movie not being an actor? Were you scared? Definitely. I mean, you know, it's like you said, it was a complete career change. Right. Like when he when we got the offer. Um, and because when we were, when we knew that we were getting a movie made on our lives by Clint Eastwood, what that was, you, what you, I mean, that was enough. Yeah. You know? yeah of like, course. We were like, Oh, this is fucking dope. Like, you know, like how much better can this get? And, but we were also kind of like, well, you know, it's going to take its natural course. This is going to be awesome for a year. The actors that portray us will essentially take over our, our identity, which mm-hmm. seems to happen, uh, and, and, and re- based on real life right. stories. And you know, that's just what happens. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to have to figure out what the hell we're going to do with our lives after this. Right. And then, so when he, you know, gave us the, the opportunity to play ourselves, like you said, completely changed the game, but we have no acting experience. Right. And when he offered it to us, we were like, Fuck yes. You know, like yeah. immediately. Like, right. And like, hell yeah, we're not going to say no to that. Were yeah. you not afraid to relive the whole scenario? No, because like I said, no one died. And so in my opinion, uh, it's kind of a happy ending. Uh, even though we had to go through some trauma, uh, it ended up working out and almost becoming one of the best things that ever happened to us because not only, you know, when have we had all these great experiences, we, you know, have a movie made on our lives by Clint Eastwood, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we have such a valuable perspective on life now that I'm about to carry with that I get to carry with myself right for the rest of my life at a very young age you know and I don't think a lot of people are fortunate enough to have that at when it happened when I was 23 uh so that's been a the biggest blessing I mean let's be real the best thing at all this 
is we got to save over 500 people. Yeah. Like there's no better feeling than that. Uh, and we're almost like, damn, we peaked hella early. What else are we going to do? Ba, ba, Yo, guys, I interrupt this podcast to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And now with Audible Originals, the selection has gotten even more custom with content made for members. Uh, as I mentioned before in this podcast, I just read the book, uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. It would probably have been better just to listen to it as an audiobook uh, if you guys don't like to read. You can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals. And I'm hooking you guys up with a 30-day free trial when you go to audible.com backslash large or text large to 500-500. That's audible.com backslash large or text large to 500-500. And you know, you don't have to pick that book. You can pick any book that suits you guys. Uh, go give it a shot. You know, so, but uh, it was crazy because when we got offered to play ourselves, we you know, three weeks later started filming the movie. So it was like immediate. Wow. Uh, and we didn't really have even have time when, to think. Now, when you guys told the story, did, did all of your guys' stories line up? Cause I know during, you said you blacked out, you, you saw red, all this stuff. There was I'm a sure you missed some shit or you maybe saw things you didn't see. How did each person's perspective play out? We have that. We all definitely have three different perspectives, but all still very similar. Okay. Uh, like it's when we argue about what happened, like I would say, if anyone argues about what happened, it's me and Alec, uh, or or Alec and Anthony, or vice versa, or whatever. Uh, and it's over like technical stuff, like, like that doesn't matter. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, but that's just because you know we've been friends since we were five years old. So, right. You know we don't give a shit what we say to each other. Right. You know. Uh, but it all pretty much lined up. You wow. Know? Did they ever ask anybody else that was on the train their perspective? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you know, the like the, for the movie or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. uh, you know, the train scene in general, you know, Mark played himself and his wife. So not just us. Uh, we had the Britishman, Chris Norman played himself. A lot of the same train employees played themselves, not the ones that ran because they ended up like getting fired later. And wow. they, they like received a lot of bad press for that. Yeah. And so, um, uh, we even had the same police that boarded the train, uh, when we got to the next train station and the same, same ambulance team that took me off the train uh, three and a half years ago is the same exact ambulance team that brought me off the train in the movie. Has so, this ever been done before in a movie? Not, to this level, I don't think so. It's like a, almost like a documentary. Yeah, <laughs> like, a, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but as far as like people playing themselves in their own life story, I think the last time that's actually been done was in the 1950s with Audie Murphy. And he was the most decorated World War II veteran of all time. And then he went on to play himself in the movie and then have a huge acting career, uh, post. Wow. So that's truly incredible, man, that story. And it doesn't even end there. Yeah. So you're 23 yeah. years old. You just mm -hmm. saved some lives, escaped death twice, maybe even three times. Cause of the box cutter, you got sliced up pretty bad. Six weeks later, what are you doing? Done, done, done. You know, I'm just being 23 years old. Just stop boozing, terrorist tagging, cruising. boozing and cruising with my boys, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I pretty much like, you know, because we went on this big press tour for like six weeks. I pretty much became like the poster child of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's coming towards the end. And it was kind of like, okay, well, time to get back to regular life and uh, go back to my, what I was doing, my job. And so I'm like, all right, I'm gonna take a few days off. It's a Wednesday night. So I ended up going out with a couple of friends from Sacramento, actually, one of the girls is actually portrayed in the movie. He used to work at Jamba Juice. Okay. There's like a Jamba Juice scene. Mm -hmm. Good, some you, good juices. You know, I'm all about Jamba Juice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so uh, the, I went out with them. So it's me, three girls, and like a new boyfriend uh, that I had just met that night. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're doing what we do. We get fucked. We got fucked up. Yeah. And uh, what's your drink of choice? That night it was Patron. Oh, me yeah. too. Yeah, I'm a yeah. man. All right, all right. I think I'm 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 moving up from Patron. It's like Don Julio. Oh yeah, shit, you know, he's I'm, on getting, that, I'm getting up he's echelon an echelon now, now. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we're you know we're out at the club, whatever. But one of the girls uh, starts throwing up. So it's like, all right, party's over, time to go. Yep. And uh, we're outside, and the new boyfriend is like, "Hey, I'm gonna go get the car. I'll be right back." I'm like, "All right, for sure, I'll wait here." And we're sitting there, and I'm just kind of like making sure she's good. And, uh, three guys or not three guys, uh, about like five guys and a couple of girls walk by and they start Snapchatting her like as mm -hmm. she's throwing up. And so like, making the, fun of her, making fun of her. Yeah. Just making a big scene. And so, you know, like me being the only guy there, I'm like, Hey, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Like cut that shit out. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that how you said it? 
Pretty much. Yeah. And, but just drunk off Patron. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, at that point, you know, start arguing. It escalates. The girls I was with start yelling and get up in the guy's face. Now I'm like realizing like, oh shit, like this is about to get serious. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm like, I'm the only guy here. I'm not, like, I'm going to have to fight him. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like trying to de-escalate now. And I'm like pushing my, my friend Lisa back. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, chill, chill. Let's go. Let's go. And uh, the guy's on my back. And then out of nowhere, he pretty much just jumps over my shoulder and just boom, decks Lisa in the face. The girl. Punches her. Uh, and they, I'm surprised she didn't get her teeth knocked out. Did like, she, she got hit, hit anyone? Hard. Uh, I'm sure she was like swinging and like, yeah. she, you know, so, but like he blindsided her pretty much. I mean, no matter what a woman does, I don't think you should ever yeah. punch her in the face, no. you know? So, uh, but it was pretty uncalled for at that point. Uh, and so I just see that happen and I turn around and I start fighting him and it turns into a five on one. Apparently he pulled out a knife even before that and tried to stab the same girl he just punched and did Try to s- stab her. So she got stabbed, like, but kind of just poked uh, with the knife. So not like fully punctured. Or All anything. over a drunk Snapchat. All over a drunk Snapchat. It was stupid. Like, and it happened like this, you know, like quick and out of nowhere. And but I didn't see the knife. So, and I still have my cast on from, right, from your thumb, from my thumb. So I really only have one arm. And uh, I'm like trapped against this wall, and I'm just, you know, like, all right, don't fall down. Meanwhile, homeboy's still getting the car. Homeboy's still getting. I don't know. He vanished. He vanished. Yeah, I don't know how fucking far that car was, <laughs> yeah. but you know, he was gone. Uh, and so he. I mean, he's kind of a bitch anyway. And he, he said some shit afterwards, and I was like, "Fuck you, bro." You yeah. know, like, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I'm like trapped against this wall, and five on one, five, five on dudes. one, yeah. And I'm just like, all right, like in my head, I'm like, don't fucking fall down. Um, that's how you get stomped out and get yeah, killed. Yeah. And, uh, and I found out later that they were part of an Asian gang uh, at, called Hop Singh. That's mainly primarily ran out of San Francisco. And uh, so I'm like, all right, get away from this wall. Boom, I pop out. I'm like run, backing up into the middle of the street. They're all still following me. And I'm literally hoping, saying in my head, like, oh, I hope a fucking car comes and runs you motherfuckers mm-hmm. over. So car doesn't come. And I'm, you know, I'm talking hell of shit. I'm like, what's up? What's up? Yeah, you know, yeah. like and backing then, up. Yeah, backing up. <laughs> and there's actually security footage on, on YouTube. So you no can way. type my name in Spencer Stone stabbing and you can see it. Wow. But I'm gonna look at that. Look it up, look it up. Uh and so I pretty much bait one of them to get closer to me and I knock him to the ground and but I didn't knock him out. He just fell to the ground. And I'm just like, at this point, like, all right, I got to knock them all out. They're following me, you know, mm-hmm. into the middle of the street. No so, one else from the bars, like... No one's stepping in. Yeah. But it, like I said, it, it happened really quick. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And so I pretty much go to punch him while he's on the ground to knock him out. And then simultaneously, as I make contact uh, with him, his friend comes up behind me and stabs me in the back, like an inch and a half away from my spinal cord. I'm like, oh shit. Like, like, like he just stabbed me. Adrenaline? Like I felt that one. Oh, you felt it. I okay. felt that's the only one I felt okay. at that point. So I turn around and I'm like squared up with him real quick just to make sure he had a knife. And I like what I felt was right. And then I'm like, oh shit. Like I see him holding it down to his side and I'm like, like, whoa, bro, chill out. And I, I run down the street and jog away and uh where do they go they all scattered okay. at that point because uh i looked down and i just see blood 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 turns out i got stabbed four times i didn't feel the first three and uh they stabbed me in my heart my lung liver and then an inch and a half away from my spinal cord and you know i was <gasps> as i'm walking away i you know couldn't really breathe that well and i just got dizzy and i you know there's five stages to death uh, the first one is denial. The last one is acceptance. Uh, and I pretty much went from denial, like, I can't believe I just got stabbed again. Like, yeah. what the fuck is happening? And then I was like, I just looked down, saw the blood. I, I couldn't breathe. And I was like, oh, I'm about to die. And uh, so I walked down the street, pretty much accepted that I was going to die, laid down on the ground. My friends came over me. It's kind of just like a movie scene. And they were like, you know, like, oh, you good? You good? And I'm like, no, I'm like, not good, obviously. You know, it's, and I told them, I was like, hey, just tell my mom, my brother, my sister, I love them, and it's going to be okay. And I just closed my eyes, passed out, thought I died. And then uh, I ended up waking up to the paramedic uh, a few minutes later, uh, giving me a sternum rub. And I remember the whole ride to the hospital, you know, 
I mean, blacked out here and there, but I remember mostly all of it. And they declared me a homicide before I even got to the hospital. Uh, and I ended Were up you dead? A, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I didn't have any like bright light type, you know, yeah. situation. I just passed out and then I woke up. Yeah, so I think I just went unconscious. But uh, from losing blood, from losing blood, yeah. Um, Did you guys? You say you got stabbed in the lung? I no. collapsed my lung. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, nicked the outer sac of my heart, and then uh, nicked my liver, and then uh, the one in my back luckily missed all my nerves, and so uh, you know I was almost paralyzed. Was, what so. What's interesting is you don't feel getting stabbed in the heart, the lung, the liver, but the one in the back and that didn't hit anything. Yeah. Why did you feel that one? I felt like as I got like a meaty back, you know, I, I don't know. I like I have like a, I think that's just from my genetics. Like I have like a naturally strong back or strong, like that's yeah. like my stronger part of my body. And when it felt, when I got stabbed there, it felt like you're, it was like stabbing a big piece of meat, oh like my in my God. back. And I was like, ugh, like what the fuck? And then when I saw everything, it was like my body, like immediately, you know, it's like when you drop a piece of glass and it cuts your foot yeah. and you don't realize that your foot's cut and you don't feel anything. And then you look down and you see the blood and then, then, Oh, and now it's just a sting. Mm-hmm. That's what happened. I looked down and I was like, Oh, and then my whole body just went into this cramp. And I was like, Oh my God, fuck that hurts. And then, uh, so when you, yeah. when you like close your eyes, cause you know, you always see these things portrayed in movies, you know, the dying scene, yeah. the last breath. Like, did you have a feeling of like, you couldn't control it or that you gave up? You know what I'm saying? Like, like you know how in up. movies they they're like, tell my mama, and then yeah. they die. like they give up. Yeah. Essentially, do you did you do that? I basically did. Yeah. Uh, I accepted I was gonna die, or at least I thought I was going to, and I was almost like, and it sounds weird to say, and I don't and I don't want to die, but I was like very ready to die, like I because I had just accepted it so quickly, and I was like, well, this is where, this is how it's fucking going, and uh, there's not much I could do about it, so. Here we go. And that was pretty much it. So I said, I kind of did, yeah, give up a little bit. I didn't fight to stay awake. That's for sure. I just can't believe this. Like you go to Paris and you have a once in a hundred lifetimes experience. Mm -hmm. Then six weeks later, you get almost killed again. In my hometown, out of all places. Did you go play the lottery? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I still can't win that. <laughs> still, can't win. still can't win that shit. Yeah. Ba-ba-da! Yo, guys, sorry for the interruption again. This episode is also brought to you by Molecule. I've mentioned Molecule in the past on previous podcasts. Uh, Molecule is an air purifier, the apple of all pa- air purifiers. It er- introduces a breakthrough science that is finally capable of destroying air pollutants at a molecular level. One customer even said that she was able to breathe through her nose for the very first time in 15 years. Molecule's technology has been personally effective and verified by science, but most importantly, it's been tested by real people. Molecule has already helped allergy and asthma sufferers around the country better cope with their conditions and significantly reduce their symptoms. This technology research was backed by the EPA. Uh, You guys, I'm hooking you up for $75 off your first order if you visit Molecule.com. That's M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com and check out using the promo code LARGE for $75 off your very own Apple of all air purifiers, Molecule. This is just because you never ever want to imagine going through this period in any of your lifetime, any of your close friends, rel- relatives, whatever, and you encounter these two things in two months. Yeah. What's going through your mind after both these things happen? Well, so I'll tell you right after I woke up in the ICU and uh, the doctor told me that, you know, I was pretty much going to make a full recovery, you know, despite having open heart surgery. Uh, abdominal surgery, uh, bilateral chest tubes, some weird funky tube in, tube in my stomach. Like you're gonna be, you're gonna make a full recovery. And I was, was this like, before, what? after the movie? Like, the this way. doesn't even make sense. This was uh, before the movie. Okay. This is about two years before the movie. Got it. Uh, and so I'm like, what? I'm like, like, are you kidding? Like, how, how fucking lucky am I? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, but like, obviously, I'm hurting. I, I'm yeah. in the ICU. It feels like I got hit by a truck. I just had my chest split open. Right. And. Uh, I'm basically sitting there, everyone, you know, it's kind of later in the night and I listen to basically this guy in the room next door to me, uh, start to die and, uh, his family's there and, uh, he, you know, I can hear the dad punching the wall, you know, like, Hey, like you gotta wake up, Kevin, you gotta wake up, you mm-hmm. know? And, 
he passes. I listen to the whole thing. The you know the family is obviously devastated. Devastated, and uh, I I kind of play dumb. And my nurse comes in, and I'm like, "Hey, what happened over there?" And she's like, "Oh, you know, we just had someone die." And I was like, well, "What did he die of?" And he said, "Oh, pneumonia." And so I'm like, "Oh, okay." Like, kind of expecting him to be uh, older. Older, yeah. And uh, I go, well, "How old was he?" And he goes, "He was 18 years old." And I was like, what? And he goes, he just came in too late, man. It was like, it happens. And I was like, and I just broke down in tears. Uh, it was the first time I like actually got emotional uh, about like everything that happened. And I just couldn't believe it. I'm just like, why the fuck am I still alive? Like, and I'm going to be a hundred percent recovered. Mm-hmm. Like, and yet this young man is dying in the room next to me of pneumonia for like pretty much no reason, like very treatable. Right. Like, why am I still here? And I guess I, you, you'd say I, I struggle with some survivor's guilt at times. Cause I am always asking myself like, why am I still fucking here? It doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. It's not fair. It seems like, uh, and so I just use that like as motivation. Like I'll never forget that moment. Uh, and I would say that was the more significant moment than anything else that has happened to me. Uh, that makes me just say, well, I got to just live my life to the fullest, uh, do the best I can be, the best person I can be. And I'm not always perfect. That's for dang sure. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I'm doing my best and I'm, I'm it's, trying to use the opportunities that I've been given in life. Right. And I'm really curious cause it's like, you can go one of two ways. You can go very downhill and fall down a very dark path after Definitely. experiencing all these things that you've experienced, mm-hmm. or you can go the path that you've gone and what's your outlook on life now that you've experienced near death experience twice you the guy with pneumonia mhm it is like it's so cliche to say but life is short you don't know don't ever know when it's going to come to an end it's going to mm-hmm. come to an end when you least expect it not everybody is guaranteed to make it till they're 80 right you know so if anything that has done with my my outlook on life now is has been able I've been able to realize what's important to me, uh, what's really important to me, and that's get still get clouded to this day mm. for me sometimes. Uh, what's important to you? My family mm. and my friends, uh, and having like good close personal relationships with people. Uh, I just love people, and uh, though that's what's really important. I mean, you know. Money clouds people's vision right. on a lot of things, I think, sometimes. And even with me, uh, I'm definitely guilty of it. But I, I feel like I've been able to realize, too, through my experiences that money really, I mean, it's cliche to say as well, money is not going to make me happy. Mm-hmm. Sure, you know, it makes me proud and I'm happy to be successful in life. Uh, but this is not what really matters. Right. You know, it's about the, the people around you, how you treat them and, and how you live your life. And, and what mark you're going to leave. Uh, I had a guy ask me recently, I still need to call him back and give him my answer. Uh, but I, 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 you know, I called him basically to get business advice. And, uh, you know, I, I, I said some things like what, what I'm trying to do and, and everything like that. And he goes, you know what, Spencer, I think you need to really take a step back and I need you to think about this instead. He's like, I need you to think about what are people going to say about you at your funeral as morbid as that sounds and like what if you're going to capsulize your life on a headstone what would that be and he's like think of that and then come back to me and i was like damn i don't fucking know yeah you know i don't think about that yeah exactly (laughs) uh but that's a good i think it's a good thing to think about you know because that's really gonna put yourself in the direction that you should go in my opinion so you, you say that you love people but this part of you hate people too, because you know there's bad people out there, and you've uh, encountered some very bad I mean, people. Yeah, I mean, I don't like certain people. You know, everyone gets in their feelings. Yeah, you know, and and things like that. But overall, does it make you so? Like, I forgive the guy who stabbed me. You know, uh, and I did, like did that publicly too. I was like, man, I just hope you do something with your life. Did like, they catch the guy? Yeah, he. But he only got nine years. I, I felt like he should have more time. I was still like, dude, you should have got more time. Yeah, I forgive you though. You know, but, and I hope you, you do something with your life, uh, and, and do something positive. I can't, I'm not going to 
sit here and be angry at you for the rest of my life. I just gonna do nothing but hurt me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not gonna be some bitter old dude like oh, this motherfucker stabbed me, and now I got looking walking around looking like Frankenstein all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, with a big old scar down my chest. Yeah. You know, so uh, and I because I gotta look at that shit every day. Every time I yeah. take my shirt off, every time I get out of the shower, I'm reminded of it. Right. You know, uh, so I can't carry that with me. You know, so I I don't try to hate people. Sure, I may say I do it sometimes. You know, like oh, I hate this guy, but I really, you know, it's really. It's really interesting that you talk about this. And and I just read the book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And it basically talks similar to what you're saying. It's like something can happen in your life that's not your fault. Mm -hmm. For example, both scenarios. These these scenarios were not your fault. But you still have to deal with them and take responsibility for what did happen. And you have a choice, basically, on how you can react to that scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, I can't sit here and, and wake up every day and look at myself and be like, fuck that guy. Yeah. You know, like that's just going to eat you alive and does nothing for you as you mentioned. So you've made the choice to wake up and say, all right, like, yeah, this guy did what he did, but like, I got to go on with my life and I can't let this like, but don't let, you know, don't let me get you wrong either, man. Like, absolutely. But I definitely have my bad days, you know, just like everyone does. Yeah. Uh, I don't like to make it seem like it's easy to make that decision every day. Uh, it's something you have to consciously think about. And, uh, I think, um, what's interesting is I just lost my train of thought, but what's interesting is, uh, with how I try and live my life, it's, uh, oh, I'm totally blanking. Uh, I had something great I was going to say, but, uh, it'll never be said. It's never going <laughs> to, it's never going to be, you're going to have to wait till next time. I have I a question. Yeah, go ahead, man. Do you have a girlfriend? I do. Have you ever had a girlfriend before her? Yeah. What hurts more, a girl breaking your heart or getting mm. stabbed in the heart? Girl breaking your heart for sure. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> there's no hope. Yeah, man. Well, hey, well, uh, this is. I, oh, you just reignited what I was gonna say. Oh, okay, this goes perfectly <laughs> like what I was gonna say. Uh, throughout my life, and you know, like I said, when I joined the Air Force, I wanted to be a pararescue man, mm-hmm. and there's nothing more I wanted uh, that I thought I wanted at that moment in my life. And even when I wasn't able to get it, there was still part of me like, oh god, like. I feel like that's what I need to do, but like, there's no way I can do it. And Mm -hmm. so I kind of still was going like, even up all the way up until the terrorist attack, I was like, I wish I could go be a pararescue man. I don't feel like happy. I don't feel content unless I can do this. But what I realized was it's most like in my entire life, I had been pushed away from the things I thought I wanted and pushed into the direction of the things I needed. And I think that goes along with people in your life too. Uh, and as sad, I can, as sad as it can be, as I know you went through yeah. a breakup, yeah. uh, and it's hard and it hurts, uh, but you were able to enjoy the time you had with that person, and you still got a lot of things from that person. Right. And you're gonna, you may not realize it now, but you know, who knows how long it's gonna take? Could take a few months, could take a year, uh, who knows? Can't say. At one point, you're gonna realize, well, that's why. Mm-hmm. Something's gonna happen to you, and you're gonna go. That's why, right? That happened, and I'm happier. And I'm, your hindsight is always twenty twenty. Right, right. So you know, and I I believe that happens as long as you're open to it. Everyone comes to that point. Do you think? Because I've I've always talked to people about this about, and they have this similar outlook. Like everything happens for a reason. It's in God's plan. But like, part of me, it's hard to to think that way because we make just choices you know we make the choices right Mm -hmm. like i made the choice to reach out to for example my girlfriend and she made the choice to respond and and everything happened and we make the choices we make i just have a hard time believing that that's pre-planned and everything happens for a reason so i believe god gives us free will right uh and gives us the tools uh, and the options, uh, and whatever decision we make, uh, you know, that, that can be the result. Sometimes not. Uh, I think that's a, it's a complicated, yeah, yeah it's an argument. You know, we right. can sit here and talk about that for a long time. Yeah. Uh, but I think everything does happen for a reason and it's planned, but it's not planned. God's ways are mysterious. Right. I don't think we're ever going to be able to understand them as mm-hmm. much as we try to articulate them. You right. know? Uh, and I think it's good to have a sense of uncertainty. 
like I, to I have a, have a mystery of like all everything just mm-hmm. in life and you know yeah, I sit in like well it builds your curiosity yeah and yeah. I'm like how does everything in the world function the way it does and mm-hmm. how did we how were but it's like if I sit here and try to think of all this stuff you know like how are we born and we turn into this and we can first thing we know to do when we come out is breathe and we need to eat and we need to drink water Mm-hmm. It's a fucking mind fuck. It's bro. a mind fuck. <laughs> and you people think we got to figure it out now, yeah, especially we don't got with shit like medicine. Yeah. Like, oh, you, are you serious? Yeah. Like, no, we're figure, we're barely figuring stuff There's out. There's right so now. many elements to the world, to life, to the universe, to humans that it's just like. I'm not even going to waste my time trying to understand. That's how I feel. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, bro, I know this is a complicated ass yeah. argument that I am not yeah. equipped to, You're like, to we talk, can talk about. about this for hours and <laughs> yeah. literally go nowhere with this conversation. Exactly. <laughs> um, but dude, what, what, a uh, through all the things that you've been through now, you, you mentioned this earlier on in the podcast and we talked about it off the podcast. You're working on a project right now that you like, you really want to, it's like a docu series, basically docu-series, about unsung yeah. heroes, is what you're mm-hmm. calling it. Yeah. And what is what is this about, and what are you trying to accomplish with this? Got it. I could do this real quick. Cool. Uh, so I want to do what Clint did for my life for other people. Got it. Uh, over the past three years, you know, me and my friends have received a ton of recognition internationally, uh, and it's been great. It's been life changing, and I'm really appreciative of it. But there's a lot of other people that do amazing things every single day, and they sometimes hardly get recognized. Mm-hmm. And whether people like to admit it or not, we all want to be recognized. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel like there's anything else I want to do. Well, you know, there's a lot of things I want to do, but I'm very passionate about this project and bringing other people's stories to light. We have a lot of great stories. Uh, that we're going to be uh, featuring on. I mean, it's the very beginning, beginning phases was just a sizzle, mm-hmm. but I'm fully confident that it's going to get picked up and you'll see it soon. So. That's amazing. Hopefully Netflix will purchase it for a very large sum of I money. I hope <laughs> so, Netflix, where you at. Um, yeah. But yeah, you want to talk about more so unsung heroes. And then like you had one event where you were a hero. You're talking about yeah. people that every single day I think go out. There's heroes come in all forms. Right. And you don't necessarily have to save someone's life to be a hero. You know, uh, th- it's there's just things happening every single day uh Mm -hmm. and what i what i also hope people will get from the show uh by the by the by the end of it is that you know don't be a bystander and that's what i talk about a lot of my speeches what's the first reaction of someone when they see someone hurting or something happened to them, they pull out their phone and they videotape. Right, yeah. and uh although that can turn out very funny sometimes and like entertainment you know, like offer a helping hand right, first, yeah. you know, uh, and there's too many people out there that are just bystanders mm-hmm. and that just see someone and they're like, oh, not my problem. And they keep it going. And I could have done the same thing, you know, in my situation, right, yeah. I, I had an opportunity to, to probably get out of there without having to, you know, rush the guy. Uh, but you know, I decided to, you know, make a decision that, you know, although I was by myself at first, it ignited the flame of everyone around me and, and, and everyone, it was kind of like, Oh, this guy's doing something. Like I was waiting for someone to step up. Now yeah. I'm going to get involved. Right, like, right. and I just need to be better to people. Like there's too much shitty people out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's always good to help someone out. So, well, thank you, man. I Thanks, appreciate man. you coming on the podcast and sharing your story and your, I, I like the motivation you brought from it, your outlook nice, on bro. life and to appreciate everything that you do have, your friends, your family, all those close to you and really hold those close because you honestly, you never know mm-hmm. when it's going to be the end. Uh, I wish you nothing but success. I hope your thing Thanks, gets brother. picked you up. As well, man. Thanks the for having Unsung me on. Heroes. Guys, go check him out. I'll link his stuff down in the description below and I'll see you guys next week on Living Large. Deuces. Oh, yeah.